Thank you, everybody. Uh, can I get some indication? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So let, let me just start by saying uh, thank you for the introduction. I wish I could have been there in person. I was looking forward to it. An unfortunate accident in my family. Uh, everything's okay, though. Uh, I am not an expert in wildflower smoke. I've become somewhat more knowledgeable on it, principally through reading many of the articles written by people likely sitting in the room uh, right now. So I wanted to give a little disclaimer or disclosure to these three papers and articles where most or half of the information that I present today can be found. Now, uh, I will present a little bit of a background as well as this short discussion on the personal protection interventions for wildfire, uh, what we know about their efficacy. I wanna spend a little time talking about lessons from anthropogenic urban PM 2.5. This is some area that we've been working on the last decade as well, and how these lessons might apply to wildfire smoke, and then take a step back and look at the implications from these PPIs, I'll call them, and what they may be for uh, their use in the real world for wildfire smoke. So just a little bit of, I think, important background. If you can see the blue hashed line here, this was the integrative exposure response curve that had been promulgated for many years that basically gave the impression that between levels of 20 to 80 or 20 to much higher of PM 2.5 micrograms per cubic meter, there was a flattening of the dose response curve for health effects. So it seemed a little nihilistic that if we lowered pollution levels from 100 or 200 micrograms down to 60 or 40, there might not be many health benefits. When you actually look at the most recent global estimate of the dose response associations published earlier or later in uh, 2018, you can see during that, in that range between 20 and 80 micrograms per cubic meter, there's more of a linear relationship now that we have more cohort studies in very high air pollution levels uh, from China in particular to fill in the curve. So what this means is for wildfire smoke or say indoor or household smoke where PM levels may be 100 to 200 micrograms per cubic meter, even an incomplete decrease in PM exposure may still yield meaningful health benefits. You don't have to get down to five micrograms per cubic meter to yield a benefit as compared to if you follow that old dose response curve. I, I think this is really important to keep in mind. Uh, we and others have published several reviews on personal protection interventions for urban air pollution. This was one a few years back. There are other devices and mechanisms to prevent the health effects of, of PM 2.5. The ones that may be applicable to wildfire smoke, I'll circle here, the uh, air cleaners, and then of course, uh, face masks, uh, filtering face piece respirators. And this is where I'll spend most of my time talking. Now, I am not an indoor portable air cleaner expert either. Uh, there are many different types of air cleaners that are available. The ones that have been used for urban air pollution and uh, a few of the studies with wood smoke as well as with wildfires have largely been porous media mediated uh, reductions in particles such as the HEPA filters that have been used. There's been a few electronic cleaners as well in studies. And the main point here is twofold. While the HEPA filter can reduce PM by 99.97% at the 0.3 micron, there are factors to keep in mind. Below, it's a common misperception, below 0.3 microns, they still reduce PM levels. And they, they will actually do it by other techniques or other physical properties such as uh, by diffusion or interception. So it's not that ultrafine particles and inner particles will not be reduced. Uh, it's in fact that 0.3 micron, that's the most difficult diameter to reduce. When you look at all of the studies from urban and from wildfire, we're getting about an average reduction of about 50% in PM 2.5 mass by using indoor air cleaners. One of the main factors isn't the efficacy of the filter itself. It's in fact, it's the clean air delivery rate and use of the proper filters for the room, as well as external ventilation and indoor outdoor penetrance. So it's important that the clean air delivery rate fits the room. Uh, and you can see rooms typically for the portable air cleaners or PACs in about uh, 120 square feet uh, to maybe five, 
500 square feet. So they can uh, be used in, in some larger rooms, but they, they clearly will not clean an entire house and many different air cleaners may be needed in different rooms. So what's available for the use of PAC, uh, PACs for, for wildfires? There really are few studies, they're mostly observational and then um, responses to surveys. One study looked at uh, the decrease in PM 2.5 indoor levels with the use of PACs and you can see they reduced indoor levels between 63 and 88 percent. Another study looked at a survey respiratory reported symptoms from uh, Northern California uh, Hoopa Reservation where 98 people used PACs for on average about 19, 20 hours a day for 15 days during a more prolonged wildfire event and surveys reported a 46 percent reduction in respiratory symptoms. Of course, these are largely observational and, and not a randomized controlled type study, but they do show that there could be some promise for PACs. There are, are two large studies, or, or sorry, randomized controlled studies specifically for wood smoke, and the authors are most certainly there in the room. These studies, I think, showed mixed results. The first, uh, more famous one in British Columbia looked at wood smoke impacted areas, and uh, there was a nearly 60% reduction in PM 2.5 levels. The health outcome was an index of vascular health, often used in studies called reactive hyperindex. And in fact, there were improvements in health. In the second study, a mix of uh, in Vancouver area of traffic related air pollutants, trap or wood smoke, there was a reduction in indoor PM levels, but the health effects were not observed in the study. And there was speculation in why that, that might be the case, some of the reasons I, I included there. But the results in general show that PACs can reduce indoor out, uh, the indoor and outdoor sources of pollutants. So indoor PM levels can be reduced by their usage. And there may be a reduction in adverse physiologic effects. So what can we learn from pollutants, uh, air pollutants at much higher levels from say studies in, in China. This was one published in the journal American College of Cardiology that looked at at Fuding, Fudan University in Shanghai in a crossover randomized study, what was the effect of a HEPA filter, or actually this was electrostatic filter, versus a sham purified indoor. Uh, and you can see at here, there was very high levels, nearly 100 micrograms per cubic meter of indoor PM 2.5. And the Air filtration actually was quite effective in reducing particle levels indoor by nearly 60%. And there were significant here by the asterisks reductions in markers of inflammation, coagulation, as well as in blood pressure. So at very high levels, these air filters can be effective and can yield some health benefits. We recently published a study at much lower but more uh, commonly occurring PM 2.5 levels in urban settings across North America. This was a study done in uh, downtown, actually in uh, midtown Detroit with indoor air filtration versus sham control uh, over uh, three days. And what was somewhat unique about our study is this was the first one and the only one I know with a health outcome that looked at not only indoor, but we actually looked at personal PM 2.5 level which is clearly important because in the real world, people aren't hostage to their air filter and, and don't camp out and live next door to it, at least uh, for any extended period of time. And what we showed, I think was quite uh, positive was that the personal PM 2.5 level, even these, even though these seniors lived in a senior facility, they were not hostage to their being in the room and they were quite active. It led to between a 30 and 50% reduction in personal PM 2.5 levels. So I think that was a, a, an important piece of information we learned. Uh, we also learned that if you look at this time activity here, during the sleep, the low efficiency and high efficiency filters were much more effective in reducing the personal level exposure, obviously because you were in your bedroom typically and uh, near the air filter. So us and other authors have concluded that at least for prolonged exposure reductions over days, a bedroom filtration seems to be very effective in reducing your personal level real exposure to PM 2.5. And this actually led this small reduction 
or at least an absolute reduction in PM 2.5 levels in urban setting led to significant reductions in blood pressure analogous to exercise uh, or uh, reduction in, in alcohol or sodium intake. So this was a, an important study lending plausibility to the real world, real world uh, potential use of reducing exposure to air pollutants. One caveat to this was just recently published and the basic message was that in very heavily polluted areas, a little bit of outdoor activity might actually mitigate the entire exposure reduction as seen by using indoor PACs. And this might be applicable to wildfires. And in, in this study, you can see the outdoor indoor reduction in particle count was dramatic. But if you actually look at the personal level, there was sometimes there were they were worse than the than the outdoor level uh, in in these patients in in China, and and that's clearly they were not held hostage to their to live next to the air filter. They were exposed to many outdoor activities and microenvironments as well as indoor activities in their own personal cloud, which could affect this. So it's something that's important, and, and that lends into the next aspect of of this is. What about the use of different types of, of face masks? Now, you can see here, there are many, I think, um, implausible masks that are not gonna be used in the real world setting, as well as a lot of improvised masks, which may or may not be useful. I'll spend time talking about so-called procedural masks or surgical masks, as well as the more commonly used FFRs or filtering face piece respirators. Um, now it is true and it's important to state that the surgical type or procedure masks are not actually made as personal protection equipment. There's no tight seal and they are not made to protect the wearer from exposures, uh, rather the reverse, they're meant to protect others from aerosols exhaled by the wearer. Now they actually might offer some degree of protection, which I'll talk about in a minute. Of course, the FFRs are actually designed in occupational settings, they are they are not made for public use, but they are highly effective and they will reduce an N95 um, wearing in a tight seal appropriately will reduce exposure by about tenfold from outside activities. They're multi-use, they can be used for many days until re breathing is restricted or until they're, they're damaged. They are, they are of course more expensive than the surgical mask, but themselves are still in the range of, of one to, to three dollars. You can purchase many devices in China, the so-called VOG mask, uh, RB, a company that I disclosed that I've done some research with, makes a face mask with a little micro uh, ventilator attached to it as well for long-term use to reduce CO2 levels and heat inside the, the air seal. Now these masks uh, are effective and you can see of course the NIOSH N95 will actually reduce the filter no, nearly 99% of inhaled particles. As well as you see a sur typical surgical mask, it's not as if they don't reduce particles, they're just not nearly as reliable in their filter efficacy. And it's widely stated and, and it true in general, as you can see during, a, this was a, a newspaper piece here that uh, during their recent uh, air pollution episode from, from the wildfires, in California that perhaps these surgical masks do a disservice in that they're not providing any protection and they may lead to false sense of security which has been stated many times and I, I think that's an important piece of information to take into account but we really just don't know at this point in time so my uh, colleague University of Toronto Bruce Hirsch uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Fran Silverman uh, as well as my brother Jeff Brook run a gauge institute uh, exposure facility here where you can expose patients to coarse fine and ultra fine particles of urban setting we've published a lot of physiologic outcomes using this facility they've now done some studies looking at with a mannequin and simulated breathing inhalation exhalation of different types of masks and their efficacy to see whether or not inexpensive masks that you might get in China on the streets and commercially available as well as surgical masks work. Some other groups have done this as well. And I think they've published similar results to uh, our data here, which are review and have uh, um, permission to use. If you have a good fit, the N95 masks, the blue here, you can see works quite well. The other masks, the inexpensive masks from the streets in commercially available 
in Beijing actually work reasonably well, 60 to 80 percent as well. The main issue is if they are not fit perfectly to the face, you can see the efficacy of all of these fall in the range of 40 to 60 percent, even the N95. Now, there's two ways to approach this. You can either say it's useless, glass is half full, or it's half empty. You did reduce exposure by about 50 percent even with a loose fit and an imperfect mask. And that, as I said, is about as good as the indoor PACs do overall as well. So I don't count them as completely useless. And personally, I've rethought this over the last year or two, uh, specifically in regards to the more recent dose response curve, that even a 50% reduction from 100 to 50 micrograms per cubic meter might not be a futile effort. What you can see here is what's mostly important is the facial fit of the mask is critically important. And, and, and clearly people uh, with beards and, and other aspects may not achieve a, a good facial fit for a seal. Are there studies with wildfires using masks? There are several, I'll report here. That original paper with the, uh, the clean air filters, which I talked about in uh, Hoopa, California, did have a limb that used FFRs. There was no report in decreased symptoms, at least in this observational study. There were health effects reported in, in Southern California, 2003 wildfire in children, not wearing masks, reported twice the respiratory rate of, of symptoms of asthma. And then in 1997, haze disaster in Indonesia, less mask use was associated with more severe respiratory symptoms. Again, these were not randomized controlled type studies and observational nature, but they lend some potential evidence that masks may be worthwhile. So lessons from very high levels in China as well. You can see this was a study that looked at the effect of wearing N95 masks amongst students in Fudan University as well, the same group. And indoor PM2.5 levels were quite high again, 85 micrograms per cubic meter. And this study showed in two days that wearing masks even amongst this healthy group of students, reduced blood pressure, 2.7 millimeters of mercury, and showed trends to improvement in autonomic function as well as other markers of inflammation. But I think that leads to some support that these face masks may have some utility. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on this next section. And uh, this is really the, the thought process here of, of where we could go from the limited amount of data that we have. And one way is if you simply use anecdote and the thought, well, these things are effective and so everybody should use them and it's logical that why would you not use them? There clearly is a risk of overuse and hysteria of everyone trying to purchase masks and, and live next to their air filter when we don't have any good evidence that it's useful. Uh, we have to balance the precautionary principle, of course, that we would assume that these the inhalation of wildfire has pulmonary and cardiometabolic adverse effects. And there's some data I'm sure presented throughout the course of the day to say that that is true with basically saying, well, we need to do nothing because there's no proof that doing anything about it is worthwhile. So how do we strike that balance of uh, an evidence, evidence base uh, at this point in time? It's not an easy thing, um, I think, to balance at this point in time. What I thought about myself in this, and largely in regards to the potential efficacy to reduce cardiovascular and pulmonary effects for urban pollution, is what's the type of effect size we would need to show a benefit here. And at least from a cardiovascular standpoint, from my slide, the next one is more on pulmonary. If you take an average 64-year-old person, the event rate is about 1% of people will have some type of cardiovascular event per year from a 65 year old. Wildfire smoke at a heavy level may increase this risk by about 20% by recent uh, evidence. And if I assume that the PPIs are about 50% effective as I showed to reduce wildfire induced cardiovascular events, some back of the napkin um, estimates here show that the dose is of exposure is really at 50 micrograms per cubic meter, about one cigarette inhaled over two weeks. And this is a reduction in about 2.7 events per million people per day. And that extrapolates into, in this group of patients, an average 65 year old healthy person, about 26,000 people would need to do an intervention 
for a two week period to reduce a cardiovascular event. In a higher risk cohort of patients with established cardiovascular disease or multiple cardiovascular risk factors, that number is cut in half to about 12,000 patients. Uh, both of those are somewhat plausible interventions, particularly in higher risk patients. I want to hit home the general population here with an event rate as so low as it is, the number needed to treat is about a million people per day, and it simply is not a plausibility uh, to do that to prevent events. This has been looked at in a recent paper in Indoor Air uh, with better mathematics and, and calculations of doses that, that I did there for my simple calculations, but very similar responses were found. And if you look at giving air filters or different types of interventions, in this case, I'll present the data on using PACs, in all homes in six counties in Southern California, their use would reduce about nine to 52 deaths during this wildfire event uh, as compared to 133 deaths that would occur. And you can see here the decreases in cases by the use of these PACs. 202 of all respiratory events would re be reduced over this approximate 10 day period. Now this is in six counties across all of California and many millions of people. So in fact, the conclusion of this paper was that the fraction of exposed population with a hospital emission attributable to wildfire smoke is small. Thus the costs of in implementing filter-based interventions for every household far exceeds the economic benefits. And I believe that would be the case for every single household, but the prior study I prevented is if this was targeted and uh, used an approach to more of at-risk patients and at-risk people, it, it does seem plausible um, that uh, this use of any of these PPIs might be worthwhile. So uh, I hope I have some time for questions if I can answer them. I'll conclude really with my own questions. Many of them were, were directly hijacked from the previous uh, very excellent reviews I presented earlier on. And what are the, the roadblocks? We don't have a lot of answers. We have, I think, a few. And I tried to incorporate some of the information we have from urban air pollution in the setting of uh, wildfires. So who? Clearly, the entire population could not be uh, uh, benefit or could not uh, plausibly uh, undergo use of these personal protection interventions. And it, it simply would be too, too many people to use. Uh, I think that the prior recommendations of outdoor workers to use the FFRs is a reasonable one. People with established cardiopulmonary diseases would be worthwhile as well. We've looked at these face masks ourselves as far as their effect on cardiovascular health, blood pressures, heart rate variability, and other metrics, and have not seen of a prolonged use from two to four hours of any changes in cardiovascular health. But we certainly have to keep in mind that people with unstable asthma or COPD, there may be some restriction in their breathing. And so we'd have to take into account who may, it might not be safe to use the filtering of face masks. When, what PM level to actually act and to alert and for how long to actually use the interventions important to discuss and to consider, how they'd be implemented as far as education for their proper use so they don't actually lead to, to uh, false senses of security, the accessibility to the population as well as to those the population at risk, whether or not they'd be stockpiled and distributed. And then of course, the risks and benefits and the costs, the possibility and plausibility a false sense of security. Do the benefits and the use of these over time actually reduce? I know the paper in Mongolia recently had showed the PM reduction over long periods of time uh, seems to be mitigated with, uh, with indoor filters. And of course, there's no reduction in the vapors and other non-particle exposures uh, during this period of time. So these are, the, these are the questions I think we need to consider when we're talking about at a personal level intervention. We're doing this with urban PM right now, considering what are the next steps that need to be done prior to launching a very large intervention trial amongst cardiovascular or cardiopulmonary patients, and uh, is such a trial plausible? And I think I have time for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the question is, can you use the AQI or the AQHI to drive when it should be done. That's certainly plausible. We've pondered 
this amongst um, American um, nationals that are working in uh, embassies in China and India and other polluted areas on when we could actually say you should use an intervention. The problem is, is, is that would mean every single day. So probably the AQI or the AQHI will be exceeded under most wildfire events to a level where somebody should take some type of intervention. And they're, they're clearly not designed specifically for using these types of intervention. I think it's a place to start, absolutely. And they may, some consideration needs to be done to think about perhaps when actions might include personal interventions for either urban or for wildfire smoke. Um, of course, they will all be just logical. There are, again, no outcome studies showing the benefit at this point in time. But I agree, it's a, it's a reasonable place to start. Uh, I had to, in the interest of time, cut out a few slides. And I had a few slides of data that we have not had published yet, but we specifically wanted to address that really important question. Are you doing as much harm uh, as you are benefit by wearing the mask, particularly in at-risk patients? And I can share with you, at least, uh, again, being a, a heart doctor, I just see the lungs as being there to like hold and keep the heart warm and comfortable and it's shock absorber for the heart. So uh, I hadn't focused on pulmonary endpoints, I, I must admit in my naivety, but if I'm a heart standpoint, we looked at blood pressure, high rate variability, uh, markers of inflammation, short-term changes in arterial compliance and such. We did not see any adverse effect on the cardiovascular system in healthy as well as at-risk patients over a four hour period. So it was a limited time uh, and uh, and 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 wearing the wearing the mask just on cardiovascular, I think the question sure should be answered amongst people who have reasonably controlled asthma or COPD whether or not the change in the uh, resistance to breathing is a problem, and I don't have data on that. But at least from cardiovascular system for short term, we were happy to say that there were no adverse or ill effects that we could see by just wearing the mask alone. So Rob, yeah, and as I said, there are some masks as well from uh, Racket Benkeiser is one company that I disclosed that I've worked with that have tried to circumvent that problem where they have little micro air filters and such that can reduce the discomfort for wearing filters for a long period of time. So there are a little bit more expensive commercially variable devices. Also children is the big deal and several of the companies are now marketing. I know in India and China, masks that, that actually are made and tailored for uh, Asian faces as well as for uh, children. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Brooke. Um, thank you very much. I think we'll give him another round of applause.